The next thing that we need to do is accelerator pump housing needs to be installed. And we need to set up the accelerator pump housing so we can set up this lever to get the correct position for it. This lever is one of those things that I always replace. These are always subject to a lot of wear and what will happen is this little hole right here where the linkage sits will tend to get egg shaped. What happens when it gets egg shaped is when you open the throttle to accelerate there's movement and the pump will lag and that will give you a flat spot. So we're going to go ahead, get our studs in, set up the pump and then drill this piece in. I just use the double nut method to wind these down until they seat. There is a short side and a long side on the thread so you do need to make sure that the short side goes into the housing. You can see on this one this thread is longer and this one is shorter and that short one is the one that you want to screw into the housing. Okay, so the bottom studs are the long studs out of your studs. The top ones are going to be a shorter one. Same thing, we're going to look for the short thread. And that short thread is what's going to screw into the body. I'm just getting all of these started and then I'll double nut and wind them down. So the next thing I want to do is set up my accelerator pumps. So first we want to put in our spring on each one and the disc. And the disc lays in like that. Now this is a check valve and what it does is it stops your accelerator pumps from dribbling. So these little uh, pieces right here is where fuel will travel in through there out through these pipes. And what we want to do is make sure that this valve sits up here. When the diaphragm goes in, just want to make sure it slides all the way down. And that'll sit right there. And you want to just kind of look and see that these holes are going to sort of line up. There is small guide plate holes right here that need to be able to push in and that's to make sure the fuel travels through the body smoothly. Now before we install these and the top plate, these, are, these don't suffer too much from distortion but I always make sure they're flat. The faces will distort quite a bit and you'll end up with these bolt hole points. People will tend to over tighten them when they start to leak and what will actually happen is it will bow that surface so we need to make sure this is flat. So I'm going to flatten this one first and then flatten this one. The last thing I want to do is you can see the backs of the pump housings get pretty torn up from years of uh, use and abuse. So I'm just taking a standard mechanics tapered ream and all I'm doing is I'm just cleaning out that hole. I'm not trying to enlarge it. I'm just getting where it's been folded in over years of use. Okay. So now I'm going to take my distribution block. The pins go on like this top pin is going to go to the top and when you slide it on you want to make sure that they go through the gasket and engage into the actual body and you'll see that it sticks down. Then I'm going to take our pump re return spring. Accelerator pumps have two sides. This pin is going to face into the housing. So we're just going to start it on there and then our other housing should just pop on. 
Okay, so when I go to put these on, I like to use nylocks. And you can see that I don't have any washers on here. The reason being, if I try and put a flat washer, there's not enough room for the nylock to engage. So I'm just going to be careful. I'm not going to over torque this. The other thing that I'll do is I'll take a small screwdriver and I'll place it down in the center of my accelerator pump. If we do it up, just holding it on there like that, the pump diaphragm's all stressed up and it'll actually stretch it in. So what I want to do is make sure the pump diaphragm is kind of relaxed and you'll kind of tend to notice on it, you'll see it around the outside of the pump, it'll sit a lot nicer. So I'm just going to get that and nip these down. And you don't want to go too tight with these because you'll dig into the zinc alloy body. Okay, once I got a couple in, that'll set that diaphragm and get a screwdriver out of my way. Okay, so the next thing I need to do is put on my accelerator pump lever. I want to make sure that this end roller moves freely. The other thing that will tend to happen is these will end up with flat spots on them. If they have a large flat spot and it can't roll, the wear will just accelerate because it won't move. Then taking a little bit of lubricant, just want to lube it down in there, make sure it still spins. On the axle, comes through the pump housing just like when we took it out. We drove it out this direction. We're going to bring it in. We need to locate it right here. A little bit of lube here and a little bit where it's going to contact the face and over here. Okay, I want to line it up on this end so that when I push it through all the way, it's going to engage in it and this is going to allow our accelerator pump to pivot. Okay, for the last bit, I usually don't want to hammer this. Uh, usually what I'll do is just take a large pair of channel locks. You do have to be aware that the shaft should come out the other end. And I'm just going to try and squeeze that. If I don't get it aligned perfectly, it won't come through. So that's something to bear in mind if it's not actually moving. There we go. Good. And it should be pretty tight in here. This knurled fitting on the end will cut a new path into the zinc. Okay, and it should look like that. You should have about that much stick out. You see how it's tapered there. You don't want the piece running on the taper. You want it on the straight piece of shaft. And then the accelerator pump should move freely and sit down in the relaxed position. So these are the two different axe heads that you'll see on the IDA carburetors. This first one was used on the early carburetors, so that's the IDA series, the IDS, uh, IDAP carburetors, and it is a much slower to activate on the accelerator pump. You can see this ramp here, how it's rounded off. This is the 69 and up axe head design, where this ramp, we will have our linkage will be sitting down in here like so and so when you accelerate it's going to move this pump a lot faster. One of the drawbacks when using these early style ramps is the accelerator pump can be slow to activate and you have to kind of preload this a long ways forwards which shortens the stroke. So if all possible I try and use these every time and very rarely will I reuse this style of axe head. So to attach this it's got its shouldered screw, which is unique to this location. Because it's a pivot point, we want to lubricate it. I'm just going to lift that up and screw this in here. Now I'm not going to tighten it down all the way just yet. I'm going to kind of leave it backed off there and then just make sure that that moves freely, which it does. So the reason why I left this loose and backed out a little bit is we have our little tiny carter pin. 
that needs to be installed into the hull. So to make it easier to install, if you leave it loose and slide the cotter pin through, then you can just go ahead and tighten it. Then I can open up my cotter pin in place. I'll trim those tails off in just a minute. The other thing you want to check once you're tight is that your accelerator pump moves freely. Sometimes you'll find with aftermarket axe heads is it'll be tight, in which case you need to use a shoulder washer, which is a special washer that goes between the body and this housing. If you use a regular washer, it'll still bind up. So that's just something to bear in mind. I'm just going to fold these ears up. Okay, the last thing we need to do is we're going to hook up our accelerator linkage for our accelerator pump. So these ones, we're just going to pop it through. It's going to have a flat washer and a knee clip to hold it in place. And these are the adjustable style, which is what you should be using on all carburetors. And then the original Weber ones have a slotted key to use to fit in here but the aftermarket ones will be an E-clip. So I'm just going to pop this clip off. Sometimes I need to go. Okay, so now I'm locked in. If we look at the top here, you can see our hole is sitting on top and we'll have to center this rod up and we'll set it up in the mill and we'll drill our hole through the shaft and put our roll pin in. So what I've done is I've set the carburetor in the mill. I have a two millimeter drill in the chuck and I'm lining up my accelerator pump linkage so it's perfectly parallel with everything. I've got the hole centered in the center of the shaft so it's not twisted and all I'm going to do is I'm just going to hold this with my finger. The starter hole in the accelerator pump linkage is going to guide my drill so I don't have to worry about it skidding out. And I'm just going to drill through so I can drive a roll pin through there. Okay, you want to make sure that you go all the way through when you do this. Otherwise, if you don't go all the way through and you put in your roll pin, the next guy that needs to service the carburetor want to be able to get the uh, roll pin out. So I've just got my roll pin started on the hole that I drilled. Drive it in. So now we've got our throttles in, we've got our accelerator pumps in. I'm going to go ahead and install my stands. These will allow me to work on a carburetor, open the throttles without damaging them against the bench. Not 100% necessary as long as you're careful. Also will help protect the bottom of the carburetor from getting scratched up. Alright, so the next thing I want to do is go ahead and install our studs and then we can start putting the jet package in. Now these nine studs are all the same length. There will be one stud that is going to be slightly longer. So if we look at those two, and it's not by much so it's easy to mix it up. That stud is going to go on the front corner right here. It's the spring plate for our return spring. It needs to go on top of the body so the stud needs to be a little bit longer. So this one, the front corner on each carburetor is going to have a slightly longer stud. sets I've used all new brass so with these there's no gasket you're just gonna thread it into the hole 
take a wide, good quality flat blade screwdriver and tighten it down. And that's it. Simple as that. Next is accelerator pump check valves on the IDA carburetors. This is an adjustable accelerator pump rod. This check valve is what's called 000, which means it has no bypass. So every time the throttle is operated, the check valve allows fuel to not flow backwards back into the fuel bowl. It allows it to flow into the accelerator pump and be delivered out through the pump nozzles. On an adjustable check valve, which is has a size, there will be a bypass hole here and that hole will literally bypass fuel out of the check valve. So on these you always want to use a zero rated check valve. You don't want it bypassing at all. This check valve is going to live down in our fuel bowl. It's going to be right down in there, that passageway. So to install, just slide that in and take our screwdriver. There's no gasket underneath this. It just will seal straight to the body. and we just want to screw that down tight. So I'm going to go ahead and load my calibration package. Now originally these would have run a 27 millimeter choke with a fairly small round of 110, 115 main jet. The reason for a small choke is to give a lot of low end performance on a small engine. So what we're going to be using for this one is we're going to switch to a 30 millimeter choke now what this is going to do for us is most of the engines out there today due to availability of parts are running higher compression. Often they're using different cams with more lift, more duration so that they can use a slightly larger choke. The effect of the choke will move the power band of the engine. The lower the choke size, the lower the power band in RPM the higher the choke size or the larger the choke size and this is the diameter across this point and this point is also very important you can't just machine this out to make a choke larger but this diameter across here is going to be our 30 millimeters it's going to raise the peak torque area or the operation of the carburetor slightly these are really simple to install there's a little dimple right there and that dimple is going to line up with the retaining uh, bolt. These most of the time will just drop in. Sometimes you got to kind of massage them down, especially if the bodies have been over tightened and they're a little egg shaped. So if you see all I got to do is turn that and that's where it's going to sit. I take my choke screw and you do not want to put a lot of pressure on these. That's why these are lock wired. So we're just going to screw it in, and as far as for tightening, that's about all we want to do. And then we will safety wire these later. So now the next step in our jet package is our main jet. The main jet is directly tied to the choke size or venturi size, whichever term you want to use for it. This is where a lot of people get confused. They think they have a bigger engine, they need a larger fuel, uh, a larger main jet, sorry. The main jet, the reason why it is tied to the size of the choke is because the choke is the restrictor on the air. And we're looking for an optimum fuel ratio with our main jet and available air to burn. So on this one I'm using a 125 main jet. Now the package I'm using is a very common 2 liter jet package. It's nothing fancy or special. It's something that was used in the 2 liters for since 64 through uh, 69 model cars or 68 model cars. What I'm going to do first is I'm going to start the jets in the jet holders and screw them down finger tight. 
These are another item that are prone to breaking. And the other thing that you've got to be very careful about is the type of screwdriver that you use. If you use something that doesn't fit well or a very cheap screwdriver, if you look at my fitting, my screwdriver will go all the way down to the bottom. It is tied in the jet and it completely goes across the jet. You have to be careful because you can damage these very easily. So I'm just going to get these started. Screw them in and then to tighten them, if you leave them sitting on your bench, take a 10 millimeter open wrench or a box end. And I just want to nip these down until they seat. We're not looking to hold the entire engine together with the main jet. So I'm just going to take my copper gasket and drop it on and it should locate and seat all the way down around that banjo fitting right there. Then with the gasket in, just going to screw that in and these should screw in finger tight and then we'll come back and tighten each one. Now the cylinder with the accelerator pump is not going to have any jet package in these areas because it's not used. We're going to install air emulsion tubes. The emulsion tubes mix the air and fuel together. Emulsion tube tuning is something that is quite difficult and takes a lot of practice only because the changes that they make can be small and there's a lot of choices in emulsion tubes. So what I'm going to do, I'm just going to drop our emulsion tubes in and these are going into our main jet wells. Then on top is going to be our main air corrector. And what this corrector does is it adjusts the amount of air that's allowed to enter this tube and mix with the fuel. Air correctors have the effect mainly on the main circuit at high RPM is where you will notice them. A three jet change in air correction is equal to a one jet one main jet size change. Now you use these for tuning maximum RPM. The uh, larger the air jet, the leaner the fuel mixture is going to be at about 5000 RPM and up. So these just get screwed down and seated. And once again, use a screwdriver that fits the jet correctly and is a good quality. I use Snap-on. For the idle jets, your idle jets are going to go into these passages. And idle jets kind of have a name because they don't just control the idle. This jet is responsible from idle range at 850-900 all the way up to around 3000 RPM depending on what Venturi and choke setup you have and size. And these just push together like this. There are two different types of jet holders. On the early cars, they do not use an O-ring here to help seal air. This does not seal fuel. It's actually to seal out the air. If you install the wrong jet holder in an early car, what will happen is the idle jet, it won't seat all the way in and it will actually leak fuel and you'll have a fuel mixture that runs too rich. So to install these, we've just pressed these in. Then we take our O-ring, and the O-ring can be put on at any time. And we just want to roll it down to that groove. And then these will screw into the side of the carburetor body. You should feel a slight pressure on the O-ring. And then you just lightly seat them. If you do over tighten, what you can do is physically squash this jet where it'll get bottomed out on this ceiling surface and you'll compact them and what will happen is this hole will close up. The actual calibration hole is located in the end of the jet. And finally, idle jets are sized by the size choke that you are using primarily. Engine displacement will play a small role, but mainly the size of the choke will determine the size of your idle jet.
Next is accelerator pump circuit. Now there are two different size accelerator pump squirters that are used in the Weber carburetors. The long accelerator pump squirters, these are used on smaller choke applications and then we have a shorter accelerator pump squirter. These are calibrated parts. You'll see these are stamped 0 .50 so that stands for a half millimeter and that is the jet size here. You need to be careful if these ever get clogged and you clean them out with a jet ream that you don't increase the size because it will change the flow characteristics. There are also two different types of banjo bolts. Now these banjo bolts are not just a bolt. You see they have a lead plug in the end and that's because inside of here if you shake it you can hear there's a small check valve in there. These are designed so when the fuel flows in through the front it pushes up the check valve allows fuel to flow but as soon as the accelerator pump stops flowing, the check ball drops down and stops fuel being sucked through the nozzle into the engine. There are also two different sealing types. The very early banjo bolts, this was flat in this surface and they used a gasket on top and bottom. On all of the later bolts they are tapered so when you screw them in they will sit, that tapered portion will seal against the top of the jet. So you do need to kind of look and see which style you have in your engine. It doesn't matter, you can use either, you can mix and match. All of the replacement ones come with a taper. To install, I'm going to take my copper seal ring and drop it on the threads first. Then to put in a pump jet, I'm just going to put the banjo bolt through. Pump jet needs to sit all the way down and then screw it down. Just like that. I always like to set up my accelerator pump circuit before I have my auxiliary boosters in. It gives me lots of room to get the measuring vial in. And then to set up the pump circuit, I'm going to use a non-acetone brake cleaner. This is an alcohol base, so it won't affect my diaphragms. It also evaporates completely once it's drained. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to fill up the fuel bowl which has the accelerator pump check valve in it. And it's going to take a little bit. But this will allow us to pump fluid through the system and set our discharge volume. Okay, you don't have to, if you fill it up past the pivot here and you don't have it in, it's obviously going to leak in. Realistically, you just got to make sure that the check valve is covered. And then I'm going to start to pump our fuel through. So right now I've set this up with the short ones on these two cylinders and these are 30 millimeter chokes and I've set it up with a long nozzle. So when you change these carburetors from a 27 millimeter choke to a 30 millimeter and above you need to also change the pump squirters. The reason being is the pump squirter when you activate it the jet is supposed to squirt against the side of the Venturi and this helps atomize the fuel that causes it to break up. If you look at the, 20, uh, the long nozzle that's used with the 27 millimeter choke and it completely misses. It squirts all the way down. So when you open the throttle you can see how the fuel squirts straight past the throttle plate and injects a large amount of raw fuel. This makes it much harder for the engine to consume this fuel. So if we look at a 30 millimeter choke see how the fuel hits against the side of the Venturi and this causes the fuel to atomize into the air more efficiently. So I'm going to set our discharge volumes in which case you'll need this little P25A tool and what we're going to do is we're going to be holding this under the jet and we're going to be injecting fuel into it. Now you are going to see some differences between the outer passageways and the middle passageways. There's not a lot you can do about that because the passageway here is so short versus to the ones that are so long here. So typically I'll tend to kind of average it out. Now on this carburetor for a 2 liter engine with a 30 millimeter choke I'm looking for around about half a cc per discharge. If you've got larger chokes or a bigger engine, then you can go up as high as 0.8 of a cc and it's something that can be retuned on the car. The purpose of the accelerator pump is to 
fill that void when you snap the throttles open and you go from a very high manifold vacuum below the throttle plates to almost zero manifold vacuum so there's a delay in fuel flow out of the main circuit and the progression circuit and the accelerator pump is there designed to fill that void so to check it we're just going to sit this under you got to be careful because your throttle plates can move and crush this so you don't want to break your vial so I'm going to hold it underneath and I'm just going to do one pump and then I'm going to bring it out and we're going to look at it and this one is running at 0.65 cc's right now so we want to drop it down to 0.5 which is going to be right here to reduce it I'm going to take my small quarter drive and I'm going to preload this rod so when I screw it in what it's going to do is it's going to move my cam or my starting point further up and I'm just going to take best guess and then we'll measure it again normally after I've adjusted it just hit your accelerator discharge once and then we're going to come under the same one and we want to make sure that you do a complete discharge all the way to full throttle and then hold it down for just a little bit and we landed right on 0.5 of a cc so I'm going to check my other ones just to see how close they are so this one's 0.45 of a cc which is acceptable and this one is also 0.4 about 0 0.42, 0 0.43 cc's. Now, if you do want to try and balance these, you can try. There are slight differences in flow on accelerator nozzles, or if you have a good set of reams, you can play with reaming these two outer ones uh, to get different amounts of flow. Typically, I haven't found much advantage. I have got them where they've been 100% perfect, but you can't feel any difference in the car. So. Uh, just bear that in mind.